involving religious liberty and freedom of conscience. And uh, we're, it's a pleasure to have you here, Zach. Then also uh, next to Zach is Christy Oshel, who's a leading young Republican in Pennsylvania. Her involvement in the Republican Party, yes. Her involvement in the Republican Party began in her first year at Dickinson College after seeing the way conservatives were treated on her campus. Uh, under Christie's tenure as chairwoman, the college Republicans more than tripled in size and became a formidable grassroots organization. She's now a graduate there and in the working world, but uh, we're glad to have uh, Christie here. Uh, then uh, to her right is, and uh, your left, Marika Beck-Kuhn, who is, uh, who is the Director of Litigation for the Foundation for Indiv Individual Rights or FIRE, Indiv Individual Rights in Education or FIRE, <laughs> where she oversees the Stand Up for Speech litigation project. FIRE is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to defending liberty, freedom of speech, due process, academic freedom, legal equality, and freedom of conscience on America's college campuses, all vital fights that we need to be engaged in. Last is uh, Ash Scow, who's a reporter at Real Clear Investigations and a columnist at The Federalist and The New York Observer, where she covers campus issues, including lack of free speech. She's previously worked for the Washington Examiner and the Heritage Foundation. Her work has also been featured in the New York Post and The Hill, and has been picked up by the New York Times, Washington Post, and MSNBC. She's appeared on Fox News in a documentary about the lack of due process on college campus. Please welcome our panel, and then Zach will proceed. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you to the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference for hosting this event, and specifically for devoting time to discuss the protection of freedom of speech, which is coming under assault, not just on our college campuses, which I'm sure we'll discuss at length, but also in other areas as evidenced by the number of cases reviewed by the Supreme Court this term, which on some level involve an infringement upon the right to free speech and free expression. As mentioned, I'm an attorney with ADF, and most of you probably associate uh, Alliance Defending Freedom with our work on life and religious liberty. Uh, but one of our most active areas of litigation is concerning free speech, defending the rights of expression and association of college students. ADF's Center for Academic Freedom has over 400 legal wins in this space over the last few years regular representing groups like Students for Life, Young Americans for Liberty, which you just heard from, and Turning Point USA. One of our most recent cases, which is one I believe that the last speaker mentioned, uh, was that of Kellogg Community College in which students were arrested for handing out copies of the Constitution. Uh, thankfully, that case has been resolved, and of course, all charges uh, were dropped there. Um, but besides that, that the issue that uh, today's students are tomorrow's leaders, the other reason that we're involved in this space is that we think that civil liberties travel together, that free speech and religious liberty are fully intertwined together. You can't have religious liberty without the freedom of speech, and you can't truly have the freedom of speech unless you're allowed to speak or not speak about religion. Uh, the threat against free speech on campus has become pretty extreme, uh, even to the point of teachers going after students for chalking messages on sidewalks. To kind of show you the extreme nature of this opposition to free speech on campus, we have a short little two-minute video that shows what happened in one of our recent cases. Do we have that? Sounds to be there. Is there sound on this? We're looking at that. Hey guys, you know we have permission for this stuff, right? We have a teacher that's telling us to get yeah. What's your teacher's name? Beth. You're not sure? Uh -huh. So why are you taking them off our if we have permission? Our teacher. Your teacher told you? Yeah. We need to stop recording. Yeah, I don't want to be recorded. That's actually pretty late. I have to record your part. That's interesting. Yeah. for all of this? No, you don't. We yeah. do actually have the email and you can call student from involvement. Plan from plan, plan ops and plan student ops. involvement, yes. All right, then I'll... We do, yes I am. That's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of free speech is that we have a free speech area here on campus. But we have permission okay. for all of this. Free speech is free speech in the free speech area. It's a pretty simple concept, okay? 
this does not constitute a free speech area. Okay. Okay, but we have if you permission. Have permission then I will verify that you have Please do, and then okay. please tell your students to stop until you verify that. Is it that part of what, are, what, are my, what are my so students too? doing that is not they, part of free speech? They told you that they're wiping out what we have permission for. If you we them wiping if, it out? Yes, I did. I actually have a video of it. Okay. Here, let me now show you. you didn't have permission to See? record, I you, want to be You have permission to put it down. Yes, I we do. I have permission to get rid of it. That's Good to know. This is our part of free speech. Do you disagree with our part of free speech? Absolutely, I disagree. Really? And you disagree with mine, too. No, I don't. If you want to bring this over there, I am perfectly fine with you doing it. I am perfectly fine with you having a free speech in a free speech area. But you're exercising college your free speech in a non-free speech area. College campuses are not free speech areas. Do you understand? Obviously, you don't understand. I know. I'm sorry that he's wearing a skewer. <laughs> so this is a college professor. Um, and this was one of our cases at Students for Life, and uh, of course this case uh, is now settled, and it's actually one of my favorite settlements because not only with uh, the school having to pay damages, the judge also agreed to require this teacher to go undergo two hours of First Amendment training by an ADF attorney. <laughs> As I said, my, my favorite settlement that we've had so far. <clears throat> uh, but issues of free speech are not just on campus. A significant theme of the current Supreme Court term has been the freedom of speech, specifically compelled speech, and whether the government can force private individuals to engage in speech with which they disagree. Our case, Masterpiece Cake Shop, dealt in part with whether the government can compel artists to con uh, create expression that violates their beliefs. Uh, also, you had the Janus case, which focused on whether non-union members can be forced to pay agency fees, which will be forced, uh, we used to support causes they disagree with. It was also a case in Minnesota centered on whether the government can prohibit a voter from speech in a voting place, essentially wearing the, uh, the, an expressive statement or even pr pr promoting a candidate uh, of their choice on their, on their own shirt. Uh, and lastly, the case we argued a few weeks ago at the Supreme Court, Nifla versus Becerra, uh, this issue was a compelled speech case on whether the disclosures required by California as applied to pro-life pregnancy centers violated the First Amendment. Despite it taking place in an abortion setting, the legal question there focused solely on free speech, which underscores how civil liberties are interconnected, where the ability of a pro-life pregnancy center to operate according to its values is threatened by the government requiring that the certain speech that undermines its very purpose. In closing, freedom of speech is connected to all fundamental liberties, and it is important that it receive the utmost protection, not only on campus, but throughout society as a whole. Thank you. So as we were able to see from that video, free speech issues are hot topics on college campuses today. So we often hear about what goes on at Berkeley and Middlebury, but rarely do we hear about the day-to-day -day monotony of being a college Republican on a hostile campus. For me, my senior year was eye-opening. I started the year off strong, advocating for Donald Trump throughout the election cycle, trying to engage in conversations with my peers about what a Clinton presidency meant for their future and our country. And as leader of the college Republicans, I really believe that we had an impact on our campus. We became part of the dialogue, whether our peers or the college administration wanted us to be. On November 8th, 2016, in the early hours before the polls opened, a group of college Republicans and I hung a thousand Podesta emails in our student union. We wanted our, our peers on campus to really have all the facts before they walked into the polling booth that day. By the time I left my 9 a.m. class, every single email was taken down. My organization as a whole and individual members of my orga organization were ridiculed and belittled on social media. And to contrast that experience, uh, signs supporting Planned Parenthood protesting the North Dakota Access Pipeline were hanging for weeks in the same spot where we hung up all those Podesta emails just a few hours before. And an even more extreme example, our college has an annual Thanksgiving dinner. It's one of the most well-attended events on campus, and all the students look forward to it. A group that is more or less associated with Black Lives Matter stormed into the cafeteria, stood on tables, and screamed at students and tried to get them to understand their point of view. 
And they stared students down until they stood up in support for the things they were advocating. I think this really highlights the complexity of free speech issues on college campuses today. College administrations will not come out and say that conservative organizations can't speak, can't have events, can't exist. But when it comes time to support those students and protect those students, they remain silent. So while our activism had the college administration look away, that Black Lives Matter organization had a town hall on our college campus as a result of their behavior. So for students on college campuses that are conservative, it's an uphill battle. Every day they're making trade-offs about whether or not voicing their opinion will impact the GPA they think they deserve at the end of the semester, whether they will be ostracized socially on their campus, and for me, whether I would win student government elections. But with that in mind, I do believe that these organizations are resilient. They know the importance of standing up and advocating for their beliefs. And I believe that they will be effective and can bring about change on college campuses. I'm often asked time and again, why am I so strong in that belief? And I say, because I was a student that wasn't always as vocal as I could have been. During my freshman year, I attended a leadership retreat. At the end of the weekend, they asked us to think about what we wanted our legacy on our college campus to be. And I wrote down that I wanted my legacy to be promoting conservative values and principles and helping others understand those principles on my campus. I understood that I needed to stand up, that I needed to voice my opinions and beliefs so others would feel comfortable doing the same. Our college Republican organization multiplied during the years that I was in college. And I really believe that we had a strong impact on our campus. So with that in mind, I know there are several college Republicans out here in the audience. And if you all know college Republicans or other conservative students on campus, encourage them to speak up. Because at the end of the day, our values are timeless. They're something to be proud of. They have and continue to make our country a beacon of hope for those around the world that value freedom, economic opportunity, and the ability to actualize on the dreams that they have for themselves and their family. So college Republicans, and for those of you that know college Republicans, it may not be easy to speak up, but I guarantee at the end of the day that it will be worth it. Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what my organization does um, as a legal advocacy organization and the issues we see around free speech on campus. A lot of it is going to sound somewhat familiar because a lot of the challenges are challenges that you just heard Cliff talk about um, when he was up here right before our panel. We actually often work with um, the activists from Cliff's organization that are engaged in their student activism on campus when they get stopped by administrators who are imposing, uh, you know, uh, who are enforcing campus rules related to their ability to speak, they often come to us. They also often come to Alliance Defending Freedom, um, and we participate in legal advocacy on our behalf, on their behalf. Um, so I. I you know, I'm sure that there are going to be uh, questions um, uh, that you guys want to hear about concerning um, where I think the vast majority of media attention um, has been focused in terms of campus free speech issues, particularly I think within the, the last year, which tends to center around um, issues about speaker disruption and, um, and sometimes violence, um, uh, primarily around outside speakers who come to ca college campuses. And there are a number of reasons why that's, why that's a troubling trend, and I think we'll probably talk about that, I'm sure, in response to questions. But I actually wanted to talk about the vast majority of fires work. Um, on kind of our bread and butter day-to-day -day basis, which is um, legal advocacy uh, focusing on, again, what Cliff was talking about, the prevalence of speech codes on campus, the prevalence of policies um, 
from uh, maintained by college and university administrations that unconstitutionally restrict the when, where, and how of college student speech on campus, which the, the, prime, uh, the prime example is the infamous improperly named free speech zone, as Cliff was talking about, and I think as the teacher in that clip was alluding to, areas on campus where speech is quarantined to, often out of the way, often very small, um, where uni uh, universities and colleges say, um, you need to keep your speech over here. Everybody, you know, everybody's speech needs to, needs to be over, be kept within this zone. Um, other kinds of policies that we in our work see constantly that impact students' ability to speak on campus are uh, policies that are related to the content of speech um, and, and attempt to regulate or, or make punishable speech um, such as I, I, one that we often see are harassment codes which uh, will regulate or make punishable the content of speech by defining it as harassment. Problem with, I mean, there, is, there certainly is such a thing as unlawful harassment, um, probably defined under the law. Often you will see colleges and universities have very, very broad definitions of pros prescribable speech um, that sweep within their ambit a great amount of protected speech, a great amount of speech that just may, that, that others may find simply offensive or may be, you know, a, 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 you know bad jokes on social media, that kind of thing. Um, so we, we see college policy being uh, employed in, uh, to, to punish, to, to send uh, students through disciplinary proceedings to say this in one way, shape, or form, your speech is not okay, um, or your speech may subject you to punishment. Uh, I, I'd actually, I'd like to talk very quickly about um, one of my favorite free speech zone cases, which uh, is an ongoing litigation um, that we have actually involving a student who was out, uh, who was out recruiting for Cliff's organization, Young Americans for Liberty, um, at Los Angeles Pierce College um, out in LA. Los Angeles Pierce College is one of nine colleges within the LACCD district, community college district. It's the largest community college district in the country. Um, our, uh, client plain, uh, our client, who's the plaintiff, Kevin Shaw, um, was out handing out his pocket constitutions, and he was standing deliberately outside of the campus's free speech zone. And he knew that he was standing outside the campus's free speech zone because you could see the free speech zone painted on the sidewalk on this giant thoroughfare going through the middle of this over 400 acre campus. And that was the only place where speech was permitted on that campus. And it was actually written on the blog, it said free speech zone. iPhone in the tennis court. Oh yeah, it was yeah. A, that's great. We, we, we had this great graphic when we put out the case that I think said it best. It was, if you, uh, if you, if Pierce College campus was the size of a tennis court, the size of the free speech zone was equivalent to a standard iPhone sitting on that, that uh, uh, tennis court. It was, it's roughly the size of a couple of parking spaces put together. So of, of course, um, Kevin's handing out, he was actually handing out Spanish language copies of the pocket constitutions. Um, and he gets told by an administrator, no, 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 you have to um, be in the, free speech zone if you want to be doing that. Not only that, but you got to come inside with me and sign a permit for permission to be in that free speech zone and you got to carry it on you while you're out there handing out constitutions. Um, so Kevin was, you know, Kevin was like, this doesn't smell good. Um, and uh, Young Americans for Liberty actually put him in contact with us and we, are, we brought a lawsuit which is ongoing against not only um, Pierce College, but against every against the whole Los Angeles uh, Community College District, uh, administrators and board members of the district to be precise, um, to challenge the use of free speech zones across 
all of their campuses. Um, the district level policy not only makes it imperative um, that each campus designate free speech zones, but it declares that all of the property on all of its nine campuses outside of those free speech zones are non-public fora. <laughs> Meaning that they can be regulated by, and speech can be controlled on, on all, all across the campuses with the lowest level of constitutional scrutiny possible. It only has to be essentially like a reasonable, some kind, it's a reasonable basis review essentially. So it was, it, to us it was horrifying. Um, we are very, very hopeful that we will be able to strike down um, uh, free speech zone areas district wide in the um, largest community college district in the country with over 150,000 students, we're hoping. Um, so that's the kind of uh, that's the, it's the kind of legal advocacy that we engage in at Fire, and I'm happy to talk about more examples of the kind of speech code litigation we bring and why it's important. We are, of course, uh, a nonpartisan organization, so just like we are uh, defending Kevin Shaw's uh, speech on behalf of Young Americans for Liberty, we also have a case ongoing for a student who is handing out anti-capitalist flyers at her, co at her community college and was detained by police for doing so. Um, so we're equal opportunity in terms of uh, the First Amendment, but I, I assume everybody in this room would agree with that principle. Um, so I'm happy to talk about uh, a whole lot more cases, but I won't take up any more time now. Before Ash goes, uh, just a, a reminder, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask of the panel, the cards uh, available to you and uh, we'll collect those. Someone will collect them and bring them up here. Lord willing, and then uh, we'll ask those questions. But, uh, so um, I'll fill in anything that hasn't been talked about. Um, we not only have these issues on college campuses where the students themselves are, are being attacked or, or the speakers, right? I found, you know, from the journalist perspective, which, you know, who really cares about the media? Oh, boo-hoo us. But when we go, uh, someone on my side trying to cover one of these events, uh, the, this campus can be very hostile. And I think everybody here has probably seen the video from Mizzou with Melissa Click where she's threatening to, you know, get some muscle over on a student journalist um, and the cameraman. But uh, that, it, it, that's not even, I mean, you've got these students that are, that are making these demands and these professors that are backing them up that are sitting there saying, like, no media is allowed. So, you know, we're going to do these protests and how dare you cover us? Like, how, how dare you, like, put out what we're doing, right? Which is your first sign that maybe you're not doing something right if, you know, you really don't want the, a friendly media to be putting out what you're doing. Uh, I experienced it at um, American University about two years ago now. Um, actually, I think the anniversary of that moment was yesterday. But two years ago, I, I was with a documentary crew uh, trying to film uh, the protests surrounding, now back in this day, it was Milo Yiannopoulos. We don't really need to talk about him much. But uh, this was before his blow up, and, and students you know, were still inviting him to campus. And so he was speaking, and so we were trying to get the, the video of the protesters outside, who of course are standing out there with their megaphone saying that, Everything he says is a direct assault on me physically somehow, you know, because speech is violence now. Um, and so we're out there, and when we first go, we talk to their, like, media liaison woman who had been in the job for about two weeks. And she uh, is, is first like, oh, it's a documentary, okay, fine, you know, we want to come in and maybe interview Milo at the time, which I was, didn't want then, I just wanted to focus on the protest, but, you know, we were, whatever. Uh, we're with the documentary, and then we're outside, and we're filming the protest, and as the protest got heated up, and then she finds out that at the time I was with the Washington Examiner, she is then starting to try and get us to stop filming and to get us to come inside. And, oh, well, no, we want to be outside. We want to film the protest. Well, no, 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 because I have to watch you. It's like, why do you have to watch us? You know, look at that kid over there is filming. Well, he's a student. Well, how do you know he's a student? You know, like, oh, he's also got an internship with, like, NBC. So is he here as a student? Is he here with, like, NBC? Like, you know, like, they were just inventing this stuff. And um, so 
you know, we, we say we don't want to come in. You know, we want to keep uh, filming the protest. And she's like, well, I have to be able to watch you. It's like, okay, well, you know, how about these nice police officers out here? Can, can they watch us? And so she turns to them and she's, you know, like, will you? And they're like, yeah, sure. And so uh, then she goes inside and she's like, well, you have to stay right here, you know, right around these cops. And so as soon as she goes inside, we like turn to them and we're like, we go over there and we're like, we don't care. So we went back over and we're filming the protest. And then of course she like comes out and she's just like in a huff and is basically telling us like, you know, you can't film here and you, you can't do this. And, and we're, we're arguing back. And then she sees that uh, someone is filming her and then she's like, what is that? Are you recording me? And yes, and I'm putting it on Twitter. And she's like, can I have your phone? And it's like, no, you can't have my phone. Like, excuse you. Um, and so then she starts saying that, um, well, I'm going to come back with police and they're going to escort you off. And she comes back with a couple security officers and they're basically like not doing anything. And she's like, good, these men will escort you off campus. And then she walks away. And again, the security officers were just kind of like, See ya. You know, and, and you know, by then the protest was kind of dying down, so we left. But it was just, it's just the hostility that there is on college campuses to anyone who might possibly disagree with them or show them in a negative light. And, and for me, the big question for me for the past few years when this stuff has really gotten big, because I protested when I was in college not that long ago. Um, you know, and we had a free speech zone at, at FSU. Bill Ayers came to speak, so of course the college Republicans were going to protest that. And we were, you know, they're outside of the event, and they say, oh, well, you've got to go over, over there. You can, oh, oh, way, way over there, like beyond, because you can't impede students getting to class. And granted, it was dark out, and it was 8 o'clock at night, and there were no classes, and then it was an area where there were no classrooms. But of course, we had to be way over there. Now, granted, when Ann Coulter had spoken just, you know, months earlier, Democrats were allowed to protest, like, basically up into her face, and no deal. During the daytime, doesn't even matter what, you know? We've seen that time and time again. Um, but it, it seems to have been escalating these past couple of years, and I still haven't really been able to figure out why. Like, there's so many theories around it, and, I mean, my theory, um, which, which I was shot down on a couple times, was that um, these kids are taking gender studies or African American studies and, and they're being taught about civil rights or, or women's suffrage through the eyes of these old liberal activists, right? And so they're starting to see this in these history books and my theory is that, that they want to be in the history books themselves someday. So they're going to act this way and they're going, they think they're in this new civil rights era. And, and, and a part of my proof comes from a, a quote from an Oberlin student um, who told the New Yorker, quote, also, we're the generation that has more identities to encompass in our movement, no shade to civil rights, but it was a little misogynistic. It had women in the back. A lot of other identities, trans folks and all that, were not really included. And we're the generation that's trying to incorporate everybody. So you have this, this um, entitlement and, and this just arrogance that basically is like, yeah, we're better than MLK and the civil rights because, you know, we've, we've got more identities that we're fighting for. Not to mention that there, there's not, like, laws against those identities right now like there were in the 60s um, against African Americans. But, you know, it doesn't matter. Whatever rights you want, the, the right for somebody to call you by however you want to be called, you know, is the issue of the day. But, um, you know, the other theory is, is kind of just, and it might be more likely, that these are, it's part of this generation, you know, um, millennials that were, grew up entitled, privileged, with helicopter parents, and now they go to school, and not all of them, obviously the college Republicans here aren't that way, but uh, they go to this school and they just kind of expect the school to now stand in for mommy and daddy, right? And to continue to coddle them and keep them protected from everything that might possibly hurt them. And so that's what you see in microaggressions or um, bias response teams, right? Those are, those are the best, where students can anonymously or not uh, make an accusation against anybody, teacher, staff member, other student, for basically anything they happen to overhear, right? 
that might be biased and marginal, marginalizing. And so to your point about um, the, the, the harassment, the broad harassment, what a specific of that is basically like if you're walking down the hall and you overhear someone's conversation and you find it offensive, you can now then report that person for having a private conversation that you were basically eavesdropping to. Um, but now that person's in the wrong. And, and one of my best favorite examples is that I believe is the University of Minnesota um, actually had a bias response team for their bias response team in case the first bias response team was too biased. Um, so, I mean, that's just like the levels that we're getting down here. But, um, you know, I, it's just fascinating to me how we've, we've gotten here. And, I mean, especially when even so many of these students, it comes from liberals, right? Like the survey that Cliff had mentioned that the left is the most intolerant right now of other viewpoints because they literally believe every viewpoint that is not their own is violence and Hitler. And um, so, so you see that kind of an issue. And I mean, I think the question that all of us should really be trying to answer is like how to stop this. Like you can sue when it happens, but then that's reactionary, right? So how do you, you get ahead of this and just change the culture? And that's something I'm, I'm just not sure anyone's really, really been able to answer. I certainly haven't. Thank you, panelists. Uh, we're going to uh, go, let's thank them. Thank you. I have a number, number of questions I want to ask. And, and one um, to start off is, uh, the phenomenon of a, a Canadian college professor, Jordan Peterson, who has become a YouTube sensation showing up on all sorts of different places, talking about his standing up to what appears to be, we're not talking First Amendment because it's Canada, but a law that basically said that, if I understand it correctly, that you have to address people the way they want to be addressed. Um, and I'm wondering about your thoughts about any who would like to address this why that is striking a nerve, is that a sign that maybe people are getting a little bit, hit the following that he's getting because he has stood up to that on a college campus and saying, I'm not going to do that. Is that a sign that maybe things are turning, that people are awakening to the speech codes or things that are telling them, here's what you can't say and here's what you must say. You, you mentioned, Zach, the, uh, the case with the masterpiece Cake Baker or the, the NIFLA case before the US Supreme Court where California has t told pro-life ministries that they have to advertise for abortion, another example of forced speech. Thoughts about, uh, is this some kind of turning point with the popularity that, that uh, Jordan Peterson is getting? Well, I, I'll just quickly, I'll, I'll say that I think that that's coming, and it's already here, and it's the, the certain uh, similar bills have already been proposed in certain states um, that would require uh, the correct pronoun usage, um, particularly for teachers at uh, threat of losing your license. Uh, one has not passed yet, uh, but again, we would see that as a compelled speech issue. Um, and one of my best, my favorite stories on that though is from, I believe it was Michigan, where they had proposed this and anyone could write down what pronoun that they preferred and one student wrote down your majesty as his pronoun, which is humorous, but it also shows kind of the absurdity of where does this end? You know, so it's not just he or she, because you can be, you know, I think Facebook has 52 different genders from which you can choose. A at what level, I mean, are we going to compel people to speak words that others say? And I think that's the key issue here. I have a qu uh, question here for uh, Christy. What was the worst event of bias you experienced on campus? Oh, that's a hard question to answer. So many things happened over the course of my senior year. Um, but I would say, for me, the one that hit home the most. I was class president throughout my four years in college. And during my senior year, a group of students wanted to censure me, essentially, because I did not agree with the speakers that they were bringing to our college campus. They were all supporting leftist ideas, leftist principles, and that was too much for some of my peers in student government to handle. So the fact that I went through four years of college working closely with all of these other students, and then the minute that I really became vocal and really said, this isn't right, the first thing they wanted to do was get rid of me. 
So for me, I think that was probably one of the most difficult things I faced during college. Well, Marika, maybe this one for you or, or others on the panel. Does left-wing speech need to be in the free, free speech zones that are set up by some of these colleges? Is there, are there examples, or is it pretty much enforced across the board no matter what speech is being said on campus? I, yeah, I mean, it really, uh, for, uh, it really is a, a nonpartisan issue, I, I think. And, and, and the reason that that often is is because um, college administrators uh, are predominantly concerned generally with, uh, with kind of safety and kind of, and well, safety and rules enforcement generally. So, you know, I'm not going to knock folks for not being First Amendment scholars, but on the other hand, it's the institution's responsibility to have gotten it right in the first instance, particularly at public institutions where they are bound by the First Amendment. Um, so they, they have a, a duty, a constitutional duty, to get it right. Um, uh, I, I just, in, in dealing with administrators, when you, when we see students coming to us and, you know, we, we do see it very much on both sides. Like I said, we have, we have, uh, uh, Kevin, our plaintiff, who's a libertarian and Yvette, our plaintiff, who's a socialist. And they were both subject to speech codes and told to go to, uh, you know, and, and that, that, uh, and both subject to schools that had very, very, very kind of crazy, uh, free speech zone policies. Um, I I think that part of the uh, emphasis that you see for both campus police and, administ and, and uh, campus administrators generally on this like notion of, of, of safety threats everywhere and having to protect the campus and that uh, enforcing even kind of the most, to, to my mind, asinine rules or like, you know, your example of well, it's because of it's because of ingress and egress of students from classes, but it's eight o'clock at night and there's no classes going on, and you have to be way the heck over there. Like that, you you see that kind of really really uh, overzealous enforcement um, because of this. Uh, I think fear of anything going wrong, um, and but when they do that, I mean, what we've seen is is look at. Berkeley, right, with, with Ann Coulter or Ben Shapiro, where, you know, suddenly it's this fear of something going wrong punishes the people that would be the victims of something going wrong, right? So, like, Ann Coulter had to pay for security or something, you know, like, basically making it almost impossible for her to actually come to the campus because they were afraid of more violent protests, which then kind of allows this heckler's veto, right, where if, you know, okay, well, we're afraid of you getting violent, so we're just gonna do what you want so that you don't become violent rather than like standing up and doing any kind of like real punishment to anyone who does become, uh, I mean we saw some last sort of punishments at Middlebury where they basically had like, here's a little mark on your you know transcript for the rest of the semester and then you know that was it. Um, but there's really, and I'm not saying like, I don't really like a whole lot of punishment, but if there's like threats of violence then maybe you know, maybe like schools need to be standing up to these people rather than giving in to them. You know, I think there's something a little different too between the um, the kind of uh, ever present 24/7 um, kind of everyday enforcement that is that I think of as kind of like equal opportunity enforcement of that that you know generally like middle management administrators or low level administrators out of um, offices of student activities are enforcing, where they're just like, rule, boom, go. A and what you're talking about, which is schools struggling to deal with uh, large level demonstrations and that in response to controversial speakers, where they're not doing the work ahead of time to have set themselves up appropriately to have content neutral and viewpoint neutral uh, uh, policies in place that can handle outside the speakers that attract that attract controversy, that attract large audiences, and that and where there is the potential for 
uh, for a heckler's veto, for where, uh, for the the bottle thrower to shut down the event. Um, the because um, canceling event an event or making or, or throwing up hurdles to an event based on the content or viewpoint of the message of the speaker is is essentially like unconstitutional because it's not a content neutral basis on which to regulate because that because that is the case i think you, you see uh schools now scrambling to yeah. to to try and start dealing with this issue where they haven't done the work ahead of time to think this through um and you know i can give you a a, a, a laundry list of ways that schools could think through how to do this in a content neutral and viewpoint neutral way, affirmatively, um, but I would probably put everybody to sleep here if I did, so I won't. <laughs> I have a question for Christy. What happened with the Donald Trump cutout on campus? <laughs> so, quick story. Um, we came back to school in the fall. Donald Trump was our nominee, and the college Republicans came out in force to try to bring in new membership to our organization to show our excitement for our candidates, but also to make it known that we were there and we were present and we were going to be active during the election cycle. We brought a cardboard cutout of Donald Trump. Um, some students were physically threatened by a piece of cardboard and <laughs> subsequently filed bias um, response reports in response to bringing a piece of cardboard to an activities fair. So. Do you have to take it down? What did the school do? What did the school do? I mean, in my opinion, in a lot of these situations, it's very hard for college administrations to be transparent because if they are going to be transparent, it's going to be clear, very clear that they are in the wrong and they'll have to own up and admit fault and that's not something that any college or university wants to deal with. But I, I want to bring up, because uh, you, you both mentioned the bias response team issue here, and I, I, I want to highlight it for a second because it is kind of, it is becoming, uh, their use is becoming more and more prevalent on, on college and university campuses, and I actually, you know, I hate, I like, I'm, I feel like I'm the, like, nonpartisan, you know, minor bird here, but um, <laughs> I, I think they're a great example of why, of how censorship um, becomes a problem for everybody um, it, it, when you allow it to be weaponized in a way. So the, with biased response teams, you have colleges asking students to essentially tattle on each other for anything that they perceive as, as bias. And it, you see a lot of universities, not all by any means, but a lot of universities who use them um, using very, very, very broad definitions of bias. Um, and they were, you know, bias on the basis of political view, bias on the basis of race, bias on the basis of, like, if you feel that you've, uh, somebody's been biased on the basis of, of your the, I have veteran status, it, it, like everything. It, it, it's just anything that essentially boils down to report when you're offended. And in our um, bias response team report that we put out uh, last year after having surveyed over 200 bias response teams uh, through, through uh, FOIA work and requesting records from these universities, um, what we found was that literally everybody just uses it to tattle on each other. They, I mean, everybody is offended by something that somebody else says. So it's, you saw, we got, we, we got evidence that it was being used on the left and the right for everybody to just get mad at each other. And what was disturbing about it was these are, you know, bias response teams aren't necessarily kind of the, the mechanism of hard enforcement that universities are using, but they are a method of kind of, they tend to be a method of soft, in, of soft censorship mm -hmm. or soft in, like kind of intimidation of, around your use of language that universities use. And I will note that of the, you know, a lot of the universities that got back to us with rec open records um, said, would, you know, would point, uh, or sorry, refused to say where their complaints went. Um, but of those that did respond, I think about 42%, the complaints went to law enforcement. And for another, for 62%, 
The complaints went to the administrators who were in charge of campus disciplinary proceedings, the conduct administrators. And 12% went to university marketing departments. <laughs> so this is, I mean, if, if there ever was, a example of you know, it's like, and then the, so those are the people who are getting these complaints and then investigating them and then bringing people in for you know for for you know educational sanctions or educational repercussions or investigations or whatever whatever it may not be formal discipline but it is soft censorship I I I would call it and I, I think they're an excellent uh, an excellent example of how weaponizing language and losing our contours around protected speech will hurt everyone. Well, that's right, and, and I think as we've talked very much a lot about college campus free speech codes and, and these things that have happened because the, it's easier to see it's uh, controlled in the way it is with, with the tight control that school administrators have, but I think there's a, a, a prevalence of what we're seeing with ordinances and laws being passed all around the country that are, are telling people uh, sort of uh, I guess the best way to put it is, you know, with the litigation that we're seeing with the Jack Phillips or the Aaron L. Stutzmans or these other situations where you see those people who have artistic speech who are using their creative talents to engage in the public square, but when there's a message that they don't want to convey, suddenly they face litigation, they face prosecution by government authorities, is the spreading of these speech codes, if you will, of these, these uh, restrictions on, on them uh, well beyond the college campus. And I think it's, it's a, a dangerous thing that is, is hurting and harming our society. I was thinking, Zach, when, when we talked, I was in Washington, D.C. When, uh, when the Jack Phillips case, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case uh, took place. And I think you told me the story about the cake. There was a celebration that night after the Supreme Court arguments that were made there. And then there was a, a cake that they wanted to, to make. And maybe you can tell that. Yeah, so after the uh, oral arguments, we had a lot of our allies there for a nice dinner, and uh, we had decided it would be appropriate to have a nice cake at our event that had some uh, design on it that kind of discussed Masterpiece and, and celebrated Jack a little bit. And the ultimate irony is the baker in Washington, D.C. declined to make our cake, <laughs> which, again, we thought was humorous because, again, they didn't realize that they're proving our point. Um, and so, of course, being consistent, we said, great, we'll go someplace else. <laughs> because again, the worst thing that we would do in that situation would be to sue them, uh, because then that would make their point. But uh, <laughs> I, I just found it a great irony that the opposition here, uh, especially in that case specifically, uh, of not baking our cake for a court case about not baking cakes, I thought was a great irony. Well, let's thank our panel. We're just about out of time here. Thank you very much, all of you. And their, their bios and contact information are in your book. For us at the Pennsylvania Family Institute, if you'd like to find out more about our work, our Independence Law Center, which works on some of these issues here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, our website is pafamily.org. We've also launched a new web tool just today called whenapoliticiantellsyou.com. When a politician tells you dot com. I'd like to thank uh, Loman again for the invitation to be here and thank our panelists. Uh, have a good evening. Uh